Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see everybody. I, I just uh, told someone in the audience this is the first meeting I've been on time to all week, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, 121 days in the role, um, but it's been fast and furious, and I'm just going to go briefly here in the next nine minutes over where we are from a distal motion perspective. So you can see empowering robotic surgery uh, with Dexter. What does that mean? Um, I, you know, I, I was thinking about this last night, and we had a a panel discussion about segmentation of robotics and right product for right uh, site of care for right procedure. One of the things that I love about Dexter is Dexter has removed the barriers for high volume, low acuity cases that can be done in outpatient surgical centers, but also has the ability to flex upwards into the higher acuity, more complex cases as well. And we'll, we have a slide on kind of what we've done in, in Europe uh, to date. Just uh, full disclosure, we do not have FDA approval um, as of yet, uh, but we've had CE for several years and we can talk about our, our learnings there. So when you look at the marketplace, um, what I see is uh, very similar form factors, large form factors uh, that, are, that are designed around complex uh, cancer, complex cases, pr predominantly in urology and colorectal procedures. And really now we have this influx of, of tr fellows and residents coming out of training now demanding or needing uh, robotics to empower these, these procedures. So we're gonna talk a lot about how we're gonna do that. Just briefly on the company, uh, I wouldn't call it a startup any longer. Um, we've been ar around since 2012. Uh, you can see first clinical cases in Europe were in, in 2021 in Lausanne. Shuv is right next to our headquarters. Uh, we're CE Mark for urology, gynecology, and general surgery, and we'll, we'll pursue that also in the United States. Uh, we had our first installation in 2022, although I would tell you that wasn't our launch. If anyone knows robotics, there's a period of time where you have what I would call technical development, so fast iteration to ensure software is uh, in the right place. So we spent about a year doing that. We also spent a year doing clinical development. So port placement, where do things go? Um, and we'll talk about some of the learnings there. Uh, I actually included last night that I joined as one of the key milestones, but that's not true. Um, what is true is a thousand cases so far uh, in Europe. This slide's a little dated uh, across 30, 35 different types of procedures. Um, so we, we really are finding out where we can win and proving out that model and getting ready for our U.S. launch. Um, and then the last thing, we talked about it yesterday, we've had the ability to say no to a lot of things. So this platform is open. Uh, you can use your own visualization, your own stapling, your own advanced energy. Um, we, we decided to focus clearly on the robot and making something complex, very, very simple uh, to integrate and to use and to train on. And, and an example of this is we just partnered with Proximy for uh, telepresence, um, data infrastructure, cloud-based services. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, we believe we can use these types of uh, technologies to go from a high-touch model, which exists in robot robotics today, a, you know, a rep or a clinical rep almost in every room, to starting to virtualize some of this, uh, this, these protocols as well and, and allowing for us to do more with less. So here's the system, you know, our key marketing themes underneath empowering robotics, accessibility, simplicity, and excellence. And I'll go through a little bit of this with a few videos. So small form factor, and I would put us in a unique category. So I, I think um, all of those that have trailed the market leader have, have matched the form factor. It might, it might be single chassis, it might have a modular design, but at the end of the day, uh, there's very limited access to the patient, the surgeons in, um, a non-sterile environment. Uh, th this, this is very small, very modular. You can see we believe it can be used in outpatient ASC environment, in minor procedure rooms. Again, very nimble, very flexible. I always use the example when I was putting a simulator in my office in Cleveland, I took it off the truck. I was able to maneuver it into a, a standard door frame. So that just tells you how easy it is to move around. OR integration, um, the way that I describe this and just my experience with other technologies, this integrates into the workflow of the surgeon rather than the surgeon trying to integrate into the workflow of the robot. So a lot of the, the same laparoscopic principles apply relative to port placement and how you integrate. And we think again, from a, a learning and education perspective and most importantly, an adoption perspective, that's essential for technology uh, to be successful. And then obviously we've talked a lot about economics. I think when you, th when you think about 
The, the high acuity robots, again, they're trying to master a lot of different disciplines and they have incredible feature sets. But that really is a limiter when you start to, in an economic format, try to get uh, them you know, able to be used for the, the inguinal hernias, the hysterectomies. It, it's more of an anvil ver, you know, for a nail type of strategy. And we think we unlock that you know, to enable and empower people to use physicians to use uh, a robot on these procedures that they're desperately looking to do. So you can see here, um, this is a, the console, it's open, the surgeon is, is scrubbed in. Uh, that actually can go up and down, so that if you think of a standing desk, uh, the, the surgeon can sit or stand uh, doing the surgery, so we've focused a lot on economics. That's the, uh, the, two, the two pieces in the middle here, you'll see the surgeon console being wheeled in and how small it is. The arms are actually inverted, so if you think about a lot of the designs, uh, that don't come from a single chassis. The arms are actually out like this, taking up a lot of real estate. You know, you can see how much, uh, how much patient access uh, kind of below the belly line there that you have with this system. So simple, again, I, I'm gonna keep repeating this, but incredibly difficult to make something this complex this simple. Uh, we believe from an adoption perspective, a utilization perspective, you know, when you're onboarding, this is very, very easy to do. Again, the other thing that we've seen from a training perspective is a surgeon can lean on laparoscopic principles early in the beginning, and as they get comfortable, they can do the surgery fully robotically. So they always have the ability uh, to go back and do something they're comfortable with until, until they master the system. And then one thing that's also unique for us, and, and again, I think very important as we talked the, the, the presentation just before, I learned a lot about logistics of outpatient ASC and, and it, it's very difficult, especially when you have multiple sets of instruments trying to maneuver there. We have, we, we have uh, a single use instrument set. We only have five instruments. We believe it can do every uh, surgery with those five complemented by um, you know, a best in class energy device or stapler. And uh, again, just a quick video um, showing kind of easy use here. This is just you know, getting set up for the surgery, docking, sim simple docking procedure. Uh, and, and off and running in, in under three minutes. And, and you can see from a port placement perspective, uh, incredibly easy, the arms go down um, using the simple button interface after you align uh, with that, that magnetic trocar. Uh, and you see them inserting the instruments and off they go. So excellence. Um, you know, Dexter, obviously, it's rooted in dexterity, so we're still giving the benefit of wristed instruments, um, you know, focused on, you know, really a deep-rooted Swiss engineering. So this, this really was, uh, we, we spent a lot of time focusing on what we thought was really important and what we could master. Uh, the, the sterile console, again, I think there's multiple, multiple advantages from teaching and education and, and fellowship or residency programs, but also just having direct access to the patient. Open platform. You don't have to give up what you've already invested in. So again, preferred stapling uh, device, preferred energy device, preferred visualization system, you can use all of those. And then we're, we're gonna uh, really, I think, try to challenge the status quo relative to training and, and virtualize a lot of that. In fact, when we do installations, we send in a simulator to do accreditation with the console that they purchased, and off they go. So this is, to me, the proof point. This is what we've done in the EU, um, and you can see we've done uh, over 30 plus different types of procedures. We feel very confident with what we can do with the system. And like I said, it's made to empower lower acuity cases, but also do the complex. Uh, we just did a, a seven hour Whipple a couple weeks ago. So it, it definitely can do high acuity, but that's not our focus. And that is it. So, you know, again, I, I think uh, for me, just the message here would be, I think it's time uh, for segmentation in the marketplace, right technology for right procedure, right site of care. And I appreciate all your time. Thank you very much.